Well, good morning. This is the Lou Rockwell Show, and how great to have as our guest from Bahrain, Yosef Amoyayad. Uh, Yosef is a successful young businessman in Bahrain. He's the director of the National Concrete Company. He's an avid student of Austrian economics and of non-interventionism. In fact, he told me that when he was a student in China, where he was, we studied electronics and telecommunications for six years, and he, by the way, is, is a fluent speaker of Mandarin Chinese, that it was seeing the role of the Chinese state in the economy there that made him into a non-interventionist. You and your wife were observers at the Mises University this summer, and I was very struck in one of Judge Napolitano's classes where he was asking the non-American students there, did they still think of America as a place to immigrate to, or were they concerned about that it was becoming much less free than their own countries? He asked you, and you said, well, of course, I would never think of immigrating to the United States we don't have any taxes in Bahrain. And then you told a wonderful story about about a uh, some people from uh, uh, at least, I, I guess, a government-allied company seeking to find out from you where you kept your personal money and where the company kept its money. Was it overseas? Was it at home? And so forth. And you told them, gee, uh, no thanks. I don't want to tell you that information. Uh, so a very different, <laughs> very different situation from the U.S. But tell us, what is it like to do? Tell me, you know, what's it like to do business in Bahrain? Thank you, Lou, for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. There are lots of things I learned from the Mises Institute, and it made me aware of a lot of things. It made me more aware of my history and the history of the region around me in the Middle East. The factors which in the past led to this region thriving and what led to its decline. In the class, when Judge Napolitano asked if young people thought they'd like to move to the U.S. I told him definitely no, because back home, we feel a lot more free than we feel in, in the U.S., especially in terms of your finances. I know in the U.S. that they emphasize freedom of speech, personal freedom. But in terms of your finances, you're very not free. I don't think most people in the U.S. I don't think they compare with, with the rest of the world. Like when an American uh, citizen travels overseas, they still have to pay taxes. There are just a few countries that do that, like the U.S. and Israel and Eritrea. It's not a common thing for you to be taxed when you leave your country. Of course, it's absolutely true. If you, if you leave the U.S. and you move to, say, France, you're earning an income in France. The U.S. wants a piece of that. So, as you say, this is a very unusual, tyrannical, of course, practice in the world. I fear that it might become more frequent as the world seems to be following the U.S. into a more totalitarian and Keynesian direction. But at least so far, it's not. I mean, most countries don't are much more civilized about taxes and don't do that. Um, I think it's 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 much harder to do in a lot of places. But because most most American citizens never leave their country, so they're not aware of this. They don't compare with with overseas what's the norm. No, it's it's true that Americans are so <laughs> unbelievably provincial. I sometimes think maybe that's always been the case with empires. I don't imagine that the average Roman cared much about what the uh, Gauls thought or the uh, Spanish or whatever. You know, they had to conform to the Roman standard and speak Latin and so forth. I mean, it's just a, another argument against empire. The, the country is, is, is very big. I mean, the U.S. Is, is huge. There are lots of places to go without leaving. Before we go on, just tell us, I mean, you mentioned that there are no income taxes, no corporate income taxes, no inheritance taxes, and so forth in Bahrain. I'll tell you with the region which, which I'm familiar with, which is the Gulf region, uh, the region that produces oil. It's, it's very interesting because you have two economies. You have an economy that's uh, completely controlled by the government, and you have a completely private economy which has no taxes. You have no personal income tax. You have no corporate tax. Uh, we don't have inheritance tax, but we do have import taxes, but they're very low. They're maybe 5% or, or low. And there is some trade restriction with the countries nearby, so we're not completely a free trade zone. A neighboring country, which is the United Arab Emirates, I'm sure you must have heard of Dubai. Yeah, yes, <laughs> of course. Uh, what they did is they're the freest market in the region. That brings in a lot of money from the rest of the world, from India, Pakistan, Iran, the Gulf region, everywhere. 
all trade is going through there now. That's the trend here. And unfortunately, before uh, Bahrain used to be in this position, and it no longer holds this position. It's losing to Dubai. Anybody arguing that the way to compete with Dubai is to become freer? Besides you, there are, the, of course, of course, there are people <laughs> arguing this, but uh, unfortunately, there are there are security concerns. There are a lot of hurdles like bureaucracy. I'll tell you a story, actually, which uh, has to do with our company. You know, Ford, the Ford Motor Company. Mm-hmm. They they used to have their headquarters in Bahrain, but when they refused to give a visa to a Lebanese guy, an American of Lebanese origin, they just decided to just move their headquarters to Dubai, where they won't encounter such troubles. And the reason is because at that time there was the Lebanese war. You know, there are some Shia Sunni tensions in Bahrain, but it's not a really big problem in, in Bahrain as it is in uh, Iraq or uh, other places in the world. But there are some security concerns of like Iran interfering in Bahrain's affairs and stuff like that. Yosef, you know, ever since the end of the uh, the Cold War, which was a, uh, I, I can still remember seeing George H. W. Bush and James Baker, the Secretary of State, on the television when the Berlin Wall came down, and they and they were just stricken. I mean, their faces were white. Uh, they were these were clearly not happy guys, and of course, they were losing their their enemy. I mean, the, uh, an imperial state, maybe every state, is always warning people, "Hey, those guys over the next hill, they're going to get us if you don't give us all your money and your kids and uh, make war." So um, as the U.S., I'm afraid, searched for another enemy, they picked Islam. So Islam is typically demonized in the United States. I had an article the other day on LRC talking about what was more violent, the Old Testament or the Quran. And of course, the Bible is a, the Old Testament is a very violent book with all kinds of horrible things going on in it. But of course, you would never hear that criticized. I've, I've heard that. I've, I've uh, read some of the violent verses. And I want to just talk about this uh, supposed uh, war on Islam. Unfortunately, today, the, the people that make the headlines are the extremists. I'll just show you how an extremist might think, okay? Or, or, or just the reasoning, the logic behind the extremism. First, they would come up with a hypothesis that America is attacking Islam. And if you look at the evidence, you could say that it's true. And you could conclude that, yes, America is against Islam or any Islamic country. And then you'd say, okay, what's the, what's the response to that? Then people would go to extreme responses without looking at the real causes of the problem. And these are the kind of people that are attracted to Al-Qaeda or ISIS. This is how they think and reason. When, when you look at America's actions abroad, especially invasions, invasions of countries, that makes people become much more extreme and it angers a lot of people and it's, it becomes very difficult to reason with people. Very funny that people don't like to be bombed. I mean, it's a very strange phenomenon. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. I mean, I, I, would, I would say that's a universal value. Nobody, nobody likes being bombed. And People have extreme responses. Um, you could compare that to American responses after 9-11. Uh, people were confused. They were afraid. They would just go with anything. That was the, the kind of feeling there. There was anger, and they needed to let it out. A lot. I've heard stories of people joining the military or they just wanting to do something about it. It's, it's the same kind of thinking working here. No, and of course, virtually no American is, or very few Americans are aware that the U.S. has been uh, meddling, maybe that's not quite, I mean, certainly intervening uh, in, a, in a dramatic way in the, uh, in the Islamic world ever since probably the end of World War II, but certainly uh, from a military standpoint, ever since the overthrow of the uh, Iranian government in 1953 and the installation of the Shah. So uh, installation of various dictators, um, pretty horrendous regimes, the ones that, but, uh, you know, again, it seems to me, uh, if you can't blame this on a religion. Other, I mean, it's easy enough to, if somebody would actually, from the outside, examine the, how many people the U.S. has killed, how many millions of people the U.S. has killed, the U.S., uh, you know, um, uh, many people think that the U.S. is a Christian country. You might say that, well, Christianity is responsible for these millions of corpses. 
Uh, of course, I would argue that's not that's not Christianity. But I mean, you could see how somebody not really understanding might think that. That's true. They could think like America is one entity, you know, that thinks and acts together. And you you just have to point out that America is not one thing. It doesn't have just one mind and act to one purpose. Most of the wars happen around the region where I live, but not in it, because the the politics of the region that I'm in is is that we are an underpopulated area. Um, and after oil was discovered, there was a deal with America to to protect us in exchange for selling our oil in dollars. That was the deal struck with America. So America would protect this area from foreign invaders, which before them, uh, the British were, were um, in their place. And this was one of the major results after the end of World War II, that the uh, the U.S. demanded that Britain turn over its uh, uh, its aegis in the in the oil region to the U.S. That's true, yeah. But typically, in this region where we live, we have not encountered the direct effects of of war from from America. I mean, this is a really peaceful region, and it's governed by monarchies, and that's maybe one of the reasons why they can't. Uh, it's very difficult to tax. That's, of course, Hans, one of, uh, in, in uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe's great book on democracy, The God That Failed. He talks about why, in fact, monarchs have a much harder time taxing than democracies. I, mean, I read that book. In a monarchy, you would imagine an absolute ruler. But, but over here, how, how things work is that there is a consensus among the ruling tribe. And they rule by consensus. And there is a way of letting your opinion reach reach to them and you can share opinions. There is a system here and it's quite stable. I mean, I'd prefer to live under a stable system than a system that has people that have never been in power and then suddenly they're in power and then they want to direct the government to do a diff different policies in, in their favor for their interest group, as, as happens in a democracy. You know, and as Hans points out, a monarch wants to improve and conserve the kingdom for his descendants, whereas a democratic politician has every incentive to rip off everything during his limited term of office. He doesn't care about the future, doesn't care about what happens uh, to the country in the future. He just wants his take so that uh, monarchs don't, they don't rip off their own people. They can't get away with it, but they also don't have the incentive to do it because they want to preserve something very, very valuable for their children and their grandchildren and far into the future. That is true. I mean, I, I can see I feel it's much easier to improve upon a monarchy than to improve a democracy. Because once the majority takes over, the majority is not necessarily right. No, and of course, as, as um, David Gordon, you know David, our great uh, philosopher, uh, points out, he says, in all of political philosophy, and all the literature of political philosophy, he said, there's no place does anybody make the argument as to why the majority should be able to rule the minority. He said, because he says, what, what is, there is, of course, no, there is no argument for that. What, what, you know, what, but it, this is just assumed. Well, of course, the majority should run everything. Again, it's, it's uh, how come the minority can't live their lives? Why do they have to be run? There are a lot of myths of democracy. And yeah, I think there's no question you've got a, you've got uh, a, a, economically and from a personal liberty standpoint uh, in many ways. And by the way, there's not entirely free speech in this country either. Maybe there was in the past, but that's being increasingly circumscribed here. We have our problems. And, you know, one of the, th one of the things I want to, you know, a lot of people think, um, and you pointed out that this is uh, probably a result of colonialism, but a, a lot of people identify with uh, Islam with socialism, but uh, there really is no reason to do that, is there? That is true. And, and modern, a lot of modern uh, socialists uh, looked at Islam and uh, took a socialist interpretation of it. And there are some figures who showed socialist tendencies. But when it comes to the Prophet, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, he was a businessman. And he, he had no problem with private property, uh, with commerce. And he has some uh, very nice things to say about businessmen. If I could quote you this uh, yes, please. from the prophet. Uh, he says, the merchant who is sincere and trustworthy will at the day of judgment be among the prophets, the just and the martyrs. 
The trustworthy merchant will sit in the shade of God's throne at the day of judgment. Uh, merchants are the messengers of this world and God's faithful trustees on earth. Wow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you've heard similar things, but it sounds very, he praises just, just businessmen. There's a story I'd like to relate. Um, in, in Medina, when the Prophet migrated from Mecca, the second place which he lived is, is Medina, there was a, I think it was a famine and a shortage of food. So the prices of food started rising. Um, people started putting pressure on the Prophet and telling him to put controls on the prices. He was reluctant to do that. Then he went away and uh, to, I think, to uh, like contemplate and see if he'll get a sign from God of what to do or a, a message from, from God. But uh, he came back and he said, he didn't get any uh, message from God that he should do anything. So uh, he said, prices are in the hand of God. He resisted a lot of pressure and didn't intervene in the, in the prices. Well, not exactly the kind of thing you hear in this country it's, from, it's, <laughs> from, our, it's like, from our religious figures either, of course. It, it sounds a bit like Adam Smith's invisible hand. Are you optimistic about the future of the Gulf region? Are you, uh, from a standpoint of, you're very interested in, you, you've done a lot to help spread interest in free market ideas and Austrian economics. Your father too, you know, other people very, very interested in terms of writing and how are things going from the standpoint of spreading the ideas of liberty? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a very slow process. And the, the first thing I'm doing is trying to translate books into Arabic um, and just put put the literature out there and uh, it's a very slow process and for me uh, a lot of the insights of austrian economics helped me within my business to be able to analyze and diagnose problems and um, improve things but um, in terms of of the region there is a move but it's it's coming from the government um, in, employ more local people in the private sector because Right now, you have a lot of locals working in the public sector, which is the government ministries, and there are state-owned enterprises. And in the private sector, the private sector is dominated by foreign workers, expats, like Indians, mostly Indians, uh, Indians, Pakistanis, but the management are mostly foreigner. There is a move to reduce the number of Bahrainis in the in the in the government sector, but it's a very it's a very slow move, and unfortunately, they're um, they're trying to use the the force of the law to increase wages, increase the minimum wage, and mm. I, I don't I don't see it I don't see it working. They also imposed a, a head tax or a poll tax mm -hmm. on every foreign worker, which that uh, it's it's paid by the company. But then that goes to training local people. But unfortunately, the, we have a lot of training institutes and they train in, in things which are not very relevant to what we do. And if we don't spend that money on training, we just lose the money. So there, that, it's a kind of a taxation. It's very little. It's like $10 per worker per month. Still not a good thing. It's it's not a good thing, but I can see where the idea comes from. But in, in in my opinion, I would I would put less barriers to to working and allow younger people to enter the workforce and gain experience through work and not through training institutes. That's how I see things. Well, Joseph, you're already a uh, a leader in business and in free market thought, obviously in Bahrain and. I think you're going to become a much more prominent leader in the future. Thanks. And it's uh, wonderful when you come here to visit the Mises Institute. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, thanks a million for coming on the show today. Thank you very much, Lou. It's a pleasure being on your show. And I mean, I can't thank you enough. Your, your institute is what uh, gave me a real education. It gave me the tools to educate myself. And thank you. Well, that's great to hear because, of course, that's our goal. So thank you, Yosef. Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much for listening to The Lou Rockwell Show today. Take a look at all the podcasts. There have been hundreds of them. There's a link on the LRC front page. Thank you.